struggling to keep a roof over their heads this Christmas. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Uh, we will now move to question time, and I call Senator Dunham. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. And I refer the Minister to an answer he gave in question time last Thursday, when he suggested that one of Australia's most respected business advocacy groups was uh, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry was misleading its members and was wrong. Has the minister himself reached out to Aki in order to address the issues outlined in question time? Thank you, Senator Dunian. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, uh, President, and thank you, Senator Dunian. Well, hasn't it been a bad weekend to be a Liberal? It's been a bad weekend to be a Liberal. We've had the Victorian election results, all those claims about Oh. 15 seconds. Thank you, Senator Dunham. Regards, uh, Madam oh, sorry, President. Sorry, Senator Dunham. I can't hear you for the noise in the chamber. I Senator can't hear Dunham. you, President. Um, look, uh, President, a point of order on relevance, and I appreciate Senator Watts uh, uh, observing of weekend's events. I had a question about a question he Thank answered you. last Thursday. Yes, I will direct the minister to the question. Uh, please move to the question. Thank you. Uh, Senator Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, I have not, as the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries, Forestry and Emergency Management, I will admit that speaking to Aki has not been my highest priority because we have other ministers who have direct contact with them. Uh, but what I will say is that I've been having a lot of contact with stakeholders in my portfolio lately, and one of the things that they keep saying to me is that they are incredibly relieved to finally have a government that is prepared to listen to them, that is prepared to actually get out there and listen to them on issues like agriculture, fisheries, forestry and emergency management, rather than National Party or Liberal Party ministers that used to walk in, lecture them and tell them how things were going to be without actually listening. So I'm very happy to talk about the relationships I've got with, my, with stakeholders in my portfolios. But as I was saying, it has been a bad weekend to be a Liberal, especially in Victoria. I don't know how Senator Henderson must be feeling after all the, uh, the carry-on that we saw from Senator Henderson in the weeks leading up to the election. But it wasn't just the Victorian election that made it a bad weekend to be a Liberal. We had more revelations about former Prime Minister Scott Morrison um, and all those Senator tricks Watt, he played. Senator Watt, uh, you have drifted, and I would draw your attention back to the question. Thank Tell you, Senator Watt. The, uh, well, uh, thank you, President. I respect your ruling. I thought I had addressed the question by, by talking about uh, the fact that I'd been concentrating speaking to stakeholders in my portfolios rather than uh, stakeholders in other uh, portfolios. But what is probably going to be hardest for the Liberal Party to accept this week is that the decade of low wages that they presided over is finally at an end. Finally at an end. Uh, because we have reached agreement with Senator David Pocock. Uh, as to our policies about industrial relations, and they are going to get wages moving again, something that we know certain employer groups don't want to support, and we certainly know the Liberal Party doesn't want to support. But those days are over. Wages are going to get moving Thank again, you, Minister, and that's going to be good for business too. Expired. Senator Dunian, first uh, supplementary. Thank you, President. Let's try and come back to what I was asking about, and I refer again to the Minister's answer of last Thursday, where he queried, and I quote, so are uh, Aki telling us they're opposed to a wage rise, followed by a sarcastic comment where he said, oh, shock horror. Does the minister agree that it's extraordinary for a cabinet minister to so petulantly attack a key stakeholder about their concerns around job creation? Uh, minister. Uh, thank you, President. Well, I don't think it would be any surprise to anyone that at a, one of Australia's largest employer groups uh, would not be particularly keen on reforms to an industrial relations system which offers workers the chance of a pay rise. Uh, we, know that, we know that a lot of employer groups uh, supported the former government's industrial relations legislation, uh, and that's okay. They're entitled to their view. Uh, it would hardly be surprising that the union movement is supportive uh, of laws being changed so that workers can actually get a, a pay rise. Uh, so we are totally unapologetic about the fact that we are bringing in laws that will bring to an end the decade of deliberate low wage growth that was at the centre of the former government's economic policy. We understand there will be some people who won't be happy about it. We understand there will be millions of workers in Australia who will be very happy about the fact that we finally have a government that is prepared to put their interests first and give them the pay rise that they've been waiting for over a decade to enjoy. Thank you, Minister. Senator Dunham, second supplementary. Thanks, President. Given the Minister has just confirmed that that's his intent and what he said, will the Minister now apologise to Aki and to its members for his anti-employer and anti-job creator rant last week? That's right. Minister. 
Thank you, President. Well, if there's one group of people who should be apologising when it comes to industrial relations, it's the Liberal Party of Australia. They should be apologising for the decade of low wage growth that they forced upon every single working Australian in this country. They should also apologise for the low productivity uh, that was delivered to business uh, as a result of their conflict-driven uh, anti-agreement policies that actually hurt the interests of workers and businesses. I predict this week is going to be the week where the full reality of the federal election defeat is going to finally hit home with the Liberal Party. They are finally waking up to the fact uh, that, their, that their decade of low wages is coming to an end because they lost the election, and they lost it to a government that had a, a central platform of getting wages moving again. We are going to deliver on the mandate that we receive from the Australian people to get uh, wages moving again. I know it's going to be very, very hard for the Liberal Party, especially those from the Victoria, state of Victoria after the weekend they had, but every worker is counting on us delivering this and we're going to do it. Thank you, Minister. What, Senator Sheldon? And my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. The Albanese Labor government went to the federal election with a commitment to get wages moving after a decade of neglect by the Liberals and Nationals. How will the government's industrial relations policy agenda benefit Australian workers? Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, President, and thank you to Senator Sheldon for the question, and thank you and many on this side for their uh, continued commitment to ensuring Australian workers get a decent share. Yeah. Get a decent share, both before they were in the parliament and subsequently. And, and unlike those opposite, uh, we have a different view about the importance of getting wages moving again. Because right. the reality is, as Senator Sheldon outlined in his question, we had a government. Australia had a government for 10 years for whom low wages were a deliberate design feature of the Australian economy. A deliberate design feature of the Australian economy. Uh, and they've never resolved from that. Nope. They've never resolved from that. They didn't resolve from it in the federal election campaign, <laughs> where they opposed a dollar, a dollar a, right. a wage increase. They don't resolve from it now. They continue. They continue to argue that ha ensuring that Australian day. workers get a decent One share, day. a decent share of the economic benefits that this nation produces, is somehow a disaster for the Australian economy. Well, we on this side have a different view, and so too uh, do so many working people across Australia. And with RIR policy and legislation, this is we are making a choice, a choice to end the era of deliberate wage stagnation, a choice uh, to uh, get wages moving again, uh, obviously also a choice to work to close the gender pay gap, to take long overdue steps to put gender equity at the Part of our workplace lawyers, a choice to improve job security and a choice to wind up those institutions established with nothing more than a political agenda to promote conflict. It is a bill that will help. It is a bill and a policy agenda that will help real people, real people, workers across this country or for too long who have paid the price of the coalition's view that we weren't allowed to get wages moving you, again Senator in this Wong. country. Senator Sheldon's first supplementary. Can the minister outline how the government's industrial relations policy agenda will benefit Australian businesses? Minister. Those on the other side, to, come, to, to try and distract attention uh, from, from the fact that they actually don't want wages to increase, as demonstrated by the last 10 years, have focused a lot on small business and a lot on a scare campaign, which Senator Watt has very effectively, very effectively shot down in this chamber. I would remind those opposite that rates of bargaining for small businesses have dropped by over 60 per cent between 2010 and this year. That is under you. So, unlike you, we think it's a good thing to support small business participating in bargaining if they want to. Why? Because bargaining can help make a business more productive and flexible. That's why we have the Cooperative Workplaces Bargaining Stream, which is especially relevant to small business. Uh, it ensures that business can opt into relevant agreements negotiated by their industry associated association. And of course, we will provide funding to, fair, to the Fair Work Commission to provide small business bargaining support. You pretend to be Thank the you, friends Minister, of small your business. Time has expired. But are you Senator MacDonald. Senator MacDonald. Order. I have a senator on her feet. Thank you. 
My question is to oh, the minister. Sa sorry, Senator Macdonald. <laughs> I'm way ahead of myself. No wonder you all look confused. Sorry, Senator Sheldon. Second supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister outline how the government's industrial relations policy agenda will benefit the Australian economy? Thank you, Minister. Uh, the policy, our, our legislation and our approach makes gender equity an objective of the Fair Work Act, bans pay secrecy clauses in employment contracts, creates panel, two expert panels in the Commission to deal with pay equity and the care and community sector, ensures employers have a duty to prevent sexual harassment, makes the sexual harassment dispute process fairer and more effective, yeah, yeah, yeah. empowers the Fair Work Commission to settle disputes over flex flexible work requests by arbitration at necess if necessary, and pro prohibits Prohibits advertising jobs at below legal minimum wages and, importantly, does what 18 out of 26 OECD countries does, which is to prioritise multi-employer bargaining. You know, those opposite seem to think that the, the sky will fall down. You're behind the OECD, and the reason that so many of our competitor economies are going down this path going down this path is because it's good for productivity and it's good for cooperation. We want to get wages moving again. You Thank are stuck you, in the 10 your years of wage stagnation. Expired. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, I refer to the Prime Minister's comments on 2 September 2022. When asked if there would be a new mining tax, he said, and I quote, no, that's not on the agenda. Minister, can you guarantee Labor will not implement any new mining tax? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. Thank you, President. And um, I, thank, I thank the Order. Senator for the question. And um, I don't recall specifically, or well, I, I don't know everything the Prime Minister said going back to the 2nd of September, but I know he has been consistent in his language in that regard. Uh, and um, I, I have not heard, like, that is what he's been saying. Um, that is certainly the position of the government. Uh, but we are, can I just say, we are a mature and responsible government that's dealing with a very, very significant increases in prices for energy and an energy system that is creaking and collapsing under the weight of a decade of inaction from those opposite. Yeah, 22 yeah. failed energy policies, never landed one of them. The power was going to go out. The power was going to go out pretty much the Senator day we took, we took office. Since then, we've had supply shortages. We've got cost escalation. We had the member for Hume who hid an increase in prices. Uh, so we are dealing and trying to clean up the complete and total shambles that we inherited. Oh, sorry, uh, Senator. I answered the Minister, question. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. It is to relevance. I specifically asked, can she guarantee there will be no mining tax? Uh, the minister is being relevant to. That, uh, your question. Thank you, um, Senator Macdonald. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Madam President. And I did, uh, I did answer the question up front. Um, the government has no plans for a mining tax. Um, the Prime Minister has been very clear on that. The Treasurer has been clear on that. But I am further to my question, further to the uh, information, for the information Order. of those opposite. The government is in this area, in the area of, the, of energy, which I think has been linked to questions around tax increases, um, we are cleaning up a complete and total mess that you left us. That's the reality. Everyone knows it. Everyone knows it. That's the work that we are doing and we will continue to do uh, whilst we hold the office of of, um, uh, thank while you, we Minister. Were in Your time has expired. Senator Macdonald, first supplementary. Minister, I refer to revel revelations on the 11th of November 2022 that your cabinet was considering implementing a mining tax. Does this mean the Prime Minister is considering breaking this promise? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, I don't know uh, where that comment has come from, and I don't speak about matters that are being discussed in cabinet, but I refer you to my previous answer that I just gave you around um, the Prime Minister and his commitments. And we are not a government that breaks promises. Um, so as, as hard order as order. 
uh, Minister Resiliency. We do win. Minister, order, 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 order. I'm waiting for quiet so I can call the minister back to answer her question. Minister. Uh, thank you. We deliver on our commitments. We deliver on our promises. It's why we've delivered an increase in the minimum wage. It's why we've held the Jobs and Skills Summit. It's why our, uh, we're cleaning up the aged care mess. It's why we passed the climate change bill. It's why we're debating the National Anti-Corruption Commission legislation later this week. It's why we passed laws for cheaper childcare. It's why the budget had making medicines cheaper. It's why we passed domestic, paid domestic and family violence leave. Because we are a government that delivers on our commitments, every single Thank one you, of them. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Macdonald, second supplementary. Well, Minister, it looks like it's, uh, it's Labor looks like it's broken its promise on ruling out a mining tax. Labor has broken its promise on a $275 cut in electricity prices. Labor has broken its promise on, on multi-employer bargaining. How many promises will you, more promises will you break? Uh, thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister. Uh, thank you. We're a government that keeps out all of our commitments, and as I'll continue to go through them, I'll continue to go through them. You are wrong. You are wrong uh, in the assertion in your uh, question. It's simply wrong. We have abolished the cashless debit card. We have uh, we've started the work on an Indigenous voice to parliament. We've got the plan for an end of violence against women. We've, we're investing in the NBN. We've got the Women's Order. Economic Equality Task Order. Force. We have not stopped. Every single day we come to work is to implement the commitments we took to the Australian people to make Australia a better place for people and to fix up the mess, the destruction, the disarray and build back um, the trust in government after nine years of your systemic failures in almost every single area of government responsibility. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson-Young. Uh, thank you, Madam, uh, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Senator Watt. Following the result of the Victorian election and the disgraceful performance of sections of the Murdoch media, will the government now act on the issue of media diversity in Australia and, in particular, its importance for a robust democracy? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Young Minister Watt. Yes, this one. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, well, I do think that the Victorian election showed that there were a number of commentators on the Victor state of Victorian politics who got it completely wrong. Uh, some of them are sitting in every aisle opposite us. Uh, some of them are sitting in certain media outlets in Victoria who waged a four-year campaign against the Andrews government, uh, promoting hysteria, um, promoting um, conspiracy theories. Um, with the people who are the noisiest now. Yeah, we do live in a free country, and you know what? Some people are free to get it wrong. And you have got it wrong year after year after year about the issues that the Victorian people uh, were concerned about. Uh, now, Senator Hanson Young, uh, as you are aware, our government does have a position uh, of supporting diverse media ownership. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that the minister responsible has discussed these matters with you. Uh, but I do think, in general terms, that the, the Victorian state election again showed that some media outlets, along with some members of parliament, actually need to get out in the real world and listen to what real, real people have to say about these issues, rather than just occupying their own echo chamber. Uh, we have seen some uh, members of the Liberal and National parties, federally and Victoria, operate very closely with some of those media outlets. And what they demonstrated was that they were grossly out of touch with people in Victoria, just as they de have demonstrated that in the recent federal election and in a range of other elections as well. So I do hope uh, that the Victorian state election is a very big wake-up call for a number of media outlets as it should be also for members on the other side. Uh, otherwise, they're going to keep drifting down the out-of-touch path that they seem to be intent on taking. Senator Hanson Young, first supplementary. Uh, thank you. Does the minister agree that se sections of the Murdoch media were in fact in breach of their own Australian Press Council rules, which state that the media should, quote, 
ensure that factual material in news reports and elsewhere is accurate and not misleading and is distinguishable from other sources such as opinion. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young, Minister. Uh, thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, of course, we believe that it's important for all media outlets to uh, separate what is fact from opinion, uh, and it is an important role uh, for the media to make sure when, that when they are reporting what are supposed to be facts, that they do, do demonstrate the facts and do, do put out the facts. And then, when they want to have something to say in an opinion piece, then that, then go for your life. But there, there shouldn't be a blurring of the two. And unfortunately, we have seen occasions where that distinction has been blurred. I think that's not in the interests of the media in Australia, and I don't think it's in the interests of good public commentary about debate. Now, it's not really for me, uh, as a representing minister, to judge whether particular outlets may have breached media codes. But I would say very strongly to all media outlets, no matter who they are, that the public expects um, that media codes will be followed, um, that factual information will be presented uh, in, in a non-opinion form, leaving opinion uh, pieces for their rightful place in our democracy, but not Thank blurring you, it with fact. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Hanson Young, second supplementary. Given the Press Council clearly cannot enforce its own standards, Australian media is more concentrated than any other comparable market, and the overt political role that some sections of the Murdoch media play, will the government hold an inquiry with the powers of, the ro of a royal commission into media diversity, including the Murdoch press, as recommended by some of your own senators, a former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, and some of your own Labor branches? Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, as I was saying in my original answer, the Albanese government does support a diverse and sustainable media sector, and we recognise that quality news and public interest journalism plays an important role in the functioning of Australian society and democracy. Uh, it is essential to informing local communities. Uh, Labor has long acknowledged and voiced concerns about the level of media concentration in Australia, which is why the Albanese Labor government is focused on supporting and fostering diversity in our media. It's also why the government has affirmed a clear position that a royal commission or judicial inquiry into media concentration is not the way forward for media policy. Uh, there have already been multiple reviews and inquiries into the media and public interest journalism over the past decade, yet the recommendations from these processes have not been properly addressed. Rather than holding another inquiry, we need to be outcomes focused in implementing the backlog of recommendations that already exist. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister please inform the Senate how the government's policy settings in workplace relations and gender equality are benefiting Australian women? Thank you, Senator Walsh, Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Walsh uh, for her question and for her years of um, representing um, low-paid uh, workers, uh, in particular women, through her her uh, service through the, the labour movement, through the union movement. This government is committed to gender equality, not as an afterthought because we have a women problem, but because we understand gender equality as a core economic imperative that benefits all of us. And this government recognises that there are structural challenges to achieving gender equality that need structural responses. There's been a decade of ignoring these structural barriers to gender equality and women have been bearing the cost, including through lower pay, poor conditions and chronic labour shortages in feminised sectors. So we're getting on the job of fixing this through our workplace relations settings, investments in cheaper childcare and modernising PPL schemes, and through reforms to close the gender pay gap and investments to end violence against women. These are the structural reforms to fix the systems that are not working right for, or that are not working in the interests of women. We're putting gender equality at the centre of workplace relations by making gender equality and job security objects of the Fair Work Act and strengthening access to flexible working arrangements. We will also establish a pay equity expert panel and a care and community sector expert panel in the Fair Work Commission. We will increase pay transparency by providing pay secrecy clause, pr prohibiting pay secrecy clauses and strengthening gender pay gap reporting. We will prohibit sexual harassment under the Fair Work Act, a recommendation of the Respect at Work report, which we are implementing in full. 
While our workplace relations reforms will lift women's wages, our investment in cheaper childcare will make early childhood education and care more accessible, and our PPL reforms will give families more choice when caring for their youngest family members. Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Can the minister update the Senate on how these policy settings will drive wages growth with women in low-paid feminised industries? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Minister. Thank you, President. These important reforms will provide greater access to bargaining for workers in lower paid and highly feminised sectors. Workers like Jane. Jane, who has been an early childhood educator for 40 years. She works at East Brunswick, Brunswick Kindergarten and Childcare. Incredibly passionate about her job, but it's been a tough industry to dedicate her life and her career to. There are constant struggles with staffing shortages due to low wages and conditions in the sector. Jane and her staff, along with workers in 70 other centres in Victoria, benefit from being part of a multi-employer agreement. They have won wages increases of 15 to 18 per cent above the award. And just as important, they have won things like more time for planning and professional development, which delivers better quality care for the children that they are providing care to. But the process is currently drowning in red tape, and it shouldn't be that hard. Directors in these centres are usually educators. They're not workplace relations or HR professionals, and we're making it easier for people like Jane Thank to you, get Minister. better Senator pay. Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister please update the Senate on why this policy agenda is so critical to improving conditions that will benefit women? Thank you, Senator Walsh, Minister. Thank you, President. Thank Senator Walsh for the question. Achieving economic equality for women requires reforms to improve working conditions as well as pay. And we are amending the Fair Work Act to provide stronger access to flexible working arrangements. Women are twice as likely as men to request flexible work arrangements. But the reform is not just important for women. This will help families to share those work and caring responsibilities, which is critical to driving gender equality. Currently, an employee can ask for flexible work arrangements, but if their employer says no, they've got nowhere to go. This, the, the reforms that we're looking at will bring employers and employees together in workplaces in the first instance to resolve requests and gives the Fair Work Commission the power to resolve the dispute if needed. In addition, we will be prohibiting, we're prohibiting sexual harassment under the Fair Work Act. This complements reforms to the Sex Discrimination Act which passed in this place last Friday. Along with implementation of paid family and domestic violence leave, our reforms will make workplaces safer and more Thank flexible you, for women. Your time has expired. Senator Hanson. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change Energy, Senator Wong. With the large-scale penetration of renewables into the national grid over the past 20 years, coinciding with energy costs for Australian households and businesses rising by 300 per cent or more over the same period, is the Albanese government telling Australians the truth when it says renewables are cheaper? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. Thank you to Senator Hanson for the question. And, and yes, we are. And it's not simply our assessment; it's the assessment of those involved in the energy markets. Uh, and those assessments are public. And uh, it is the case that the lack of policy certainty over the last decade uh, has meant uh, that we have seen an increase in energy prices, uh, combined with combined with uh, the international circumstances we see, which uh, are well known to everyone in this chamber, including the war on Ukraine and the way in which energy supplies are uh, being utilised as part of that, essentially, uh, essentially part of that conflict. Well, Senator Hanson, with respect. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not simply me saying this. This is what global <laughs> markets are saying. This is what developed economies around the world are saying. Uh, and if you go to Europe and you understand uh, what is occurring in Europe and what is therefore occur and, and is occurring in global markets, the, the, they are affecting Australia's energy costs, as are being affected around the world. And Senator Rennick, you know, a bit of economic irrationality over there. Fair enough, but it's you know, the reality is the market is not where you are. The market is not where you are. Uh, but uh, Senator Hanson, uh, we 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 we, we, de we deeply appreciate uh, how difficult the uh, increase in energy costs is for Australian households.
Anyway. I'm sorry, I'm, I don't know how to respond to the interjection from Senator Rennick. Anyway, um, uh, we, we understand how difficult it is. Uh, the government is, is, is very seized of this. Uh, I would make the point to you that the irrational position that was in place over so many years under those offers, it meant that we saw supply exit the system. Uh, and we know if supply exits Thank the you, system, Minister, what your happens time to has price? Expired. Before I call Senator Hanson for her first supplementary, I remind senators on both sides this is uh, cross bench time. They get limited opportunity uh, and interjections are disorderly. And I would appreciate Senator Hanson having the uh, benefit of hearing uh, Minister Wong's uh, responses in quiet. Um, Senator Hanson, first supplementary. Thank you. Well, Senator Wong, I don't accept your answer to that question, neither do a lot of Australians, because the war in Ukraine only just started this year and energy costs have been going up for years. My question is, with domestic energy costs predicted to increase by up to 56 per cent over the next two years as more renewables come online and more coal-fired plants are closed ahead of time, will the Albanese government apologise to the Australian people for falsely claiming it would reduce household energy bills by $275 per year? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Watt. Um, Senator Hanson, we are seeking to deal with what is happening in global energy markets and what is happening in the domestic energy markets. Uh, and we inherited, as you will recall, a price increase, the policy response to which was simply the uh, former minister, Mr Taylor, hiding a price increase prior to the next election. We inherited a system which saw four gigawatts of dispatchable capacity leave the system with only one gigawatt coming in. In relation to to uh, uh, the point about renewables, the CSIRO, in their, jet, their, their report in July 2022, forecasts that by 2030, electricity produced by solar PV would be two thirds cheaper than black coal and over 80 per cent cheaper than nuclear. Wind generation would be 50 per cent cheaper than black coal and 80 per cent cheaper than nuclear. The reason the market has not invested in more coal-fired power is because the market is looking at the same predictions that Thank I have Minister. just outlined Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Hanson, second supplement. Maybe they're not looking into it because of the government shutting down coal in Australia. Considering that no human being in history has ever led a carbon-neutral existence, will the minister please explain to the Senate and the Australian people how the Albanese government's policies to bring in more than 250,000 immigrants every year are consistent with its policy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 43 per cent by 2030. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Uh, well, Senator Hanson, uh, we do think that uh, responsible levels of migration are consistent with economic growth, uh, and uh, we also believe uh, that uh, renewables uh, are demonstrably uh, a cheaper uh, energy source than, than those which I have outlined, so uh, coal and uh, nuclear, uh, which explains market behaviour over this last decade. Uh, it is the case we will have to transform our economy uh, and uh, we will have to ensure that we both reduce what we put into the atmosphere uh, and uh, offset that which we cannot reduce. Uh, and in that regard, Senator Hanson, the position the Albanese government is putting is where the ma mainstream economies of the world are. It is where the majority of the global economies uh, are. Thank you, uh, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Rustin. Hmm. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister of Health, Senator Gallagher. Um, the distribution priority area classification system has been crucial in supporting the movement of general practitioners to rural, regional, remote areas to address workforce shortages. However, the Albanese government's decision to expand the DPA means that outer metropolitan areas now have the same priority status as rural and remote parts of the country, where critical GP shortages are being felt the hardest. The Rural Doctors Association of Australia has stated that this policy change, and I quote, will cost the lives of rural and remote patients who already suffer poorer health outcomes. 
Can the minister please explain what advice formed the basis of your government's decision to expand the DPA classifications and whether you consulted with the RDAA, whose members are the ones most impacted by this decision? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President, and I thank Senator Rustin for the question. Uh, I will come back to the chamber uh, on the specifics of the minister's engagement and consultations, but I can say that I know Minister Butler uh, consults very widely and is working very closely with general practice and uh, general practice groups, you know, groups representing particular arms of general practice or healthcare uh, broadly as he's working through uh, the reforms that we want to implement. On the um, program around um, the designated status or distribution priority areas. Um, we have expanded that because there are shortages in a whole range of areas. That's the reality. Like primary care is under enormous stress, and there are workforce shortages in outer metropolitan areas, in metropolitan areas, and in rural and regional areas for sure, which is why there was a response to rural and regional um, health uh, through the budget in October, um, which had a specific measure, rural general practice package, to make sure that there are innovative models of care being trialled across rural general practice, more training placements under the John Flynn program, and looking at extra incentives uh, for doctors and nurses uh, to go into um, and, and work in rural and regional areas. Um, so we've, you know, we're looking at this across the board. Yes, there are enormous pressures in rural and regional areas. There are enormous pressures in primary care. You just talk to any GP at the moment, and they will tell you how hard it is in terms of workforce, in terms of how that they run their businesses, in terms of pressure um, that we are trying to respond to through the Strengthening Medicare Fund and some of the other responses through the urgent care clinics as well are all designed to assist Thank general you, practice. Your time has expired. Senator Rustin, first supplementary. The Warren Bungle Shire Council has previously stated that your government minister's decision to expand the DPA classifications will likely mean people in rural and remote communities will have to travel hundreds of kilometres mm. to receive medical attention. When asked in budget estimates if the government had consulted first with rural, regional and remote communities before making this decision on DPA's classification, Senator McCarthy said no. Minister, can you confirm that the Albanese government did not consult with these communities before making these decisions? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, I, I've already said I will come back on the specifics of the consultation, but I do know um, we've got the Strengthening Medicare Task Force. There's a range of consultative, well, there's a range of consultative mechanisms that the Minister Butler has put in place to deal with the pressures, to deal with the pressures that we inherited from your term in in government. The reality is you can't, you don't just have a primary care crisis that happens over two months. This has been building for years. The workforce shortages have been building for right. years. We had an that? inquiry Who that Senator that? Green um, chaired, I think you chaired it, didn't you, yeah. uh, Senator Green, into this specific matter, which made recommendations in order to deal with some of the, the pressures that experienced under your watch. So there is more to do. There is, there is more to do, but we also have to deal with workforce shortages in other areas of the Thank country you, as well. Your time has expired. Senator Rustin, second supplementary. When asked in question time in the House about the number of rural towns who have lost a GP because of the decision of your government to change the DPA classifications, Minister Butler refused to answer the question. Does Minister Butler know the number of rural towns who have been negatively impacted by this decision? And if not, why not? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister. The decision is about creating additional workforce. Um, that, is the, that is behind the decision, right? So that these other, other areas that are having trouble attracting, attracting um, GPs are able to, to work through that program. So, you know, 
Yes, we accept that there are significant workforce shortages in rural and regional areas. And it's not just GPs, it's in a whole range of health work workers. But we also have them in other areas of the country, and we need to respond to that as well. And part of the reason why we are putting in um, the urgent care clinics, the, the grants, the $220 million grants program for GPs so that they're able to to put in place supports in their practices to help meet some of the pressures they're seeing, plus some of the um, other incentive programs, is all designed to come at this from a, a number of different ways. There is Thank no you, silver Minister, bullet. Your time has expired. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister and also the Climate and Environment Ministry, Senator Wong. Today, a report from the Climate Council and Emergency Leaders for Climate Action has reported that the Queensland floods earlier this year cost nearly $8 billion, and extreme weather events over the past year have cost Australian households an average of $1,532. The report says we need deep cuts to emissions this decade to avoid climate catastrophe, something that cannot happen if more coal and gas projects are approved. Rather than propping up coal and gas projects with fossil fuel subsidies, this government should be addressing the cost of living and preparing communities for future disasters. When will the government cancel the $47.2 billion in public money it's giving in subsidies to the fossil fuel sector? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, President. Thank you to Senator Waters for a very lengthy question. Uh, and uh, well, it was a lengthy question. That's all right. <laughs> She's entitled. She's entitled to a full minute, uh, and I'll. <laughs> They're very touchy, aren't they? They're very touchy. Had a bad Saturday night. Um, uh, look, uh, Sen Senator, uh, this is a variation on a question that you've asked, and your colleagues have asked on a number of occasions. Uh, and what I would say to you is, one, we agree with the need to make reductions in the emissions Australia produces. That is a position that I have been arguing and the Labor Party has been arguing for many years. Uh, we sought to implement uh, that in government. Uh, we fought for that in opposition over nine years. Uh, and I am pleased, as I'm sure uh, uh, many people across Australia are, that we not only have a government who wish, wants to act on climate, but have a parliament that wishes to act on climate. So I think all of those points really go back to some of the points you raise. Um, it, I think the question is, what is your diagnosis or your assertion about the test to deal with that. We believe the test is as set by the UNFCCC and as agreed amongst the international community, which is uh, economies over time will make uh, reductions in their emissions uh, what will reduce the emissions they produce. That is why we have an election commitment to a 43 per cent reduction by 2030, which will see the overwhelming majority of energy in the energy sector coming from renewable sources. Now, I appreciate the Greens have a different view. I trust they also have a, a fiscal position Order. that they're prepared to take, which reflects that. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the revenue to the Australian economy by those sectors. But unlike you, we're not going to target workers and one industry. We are going you, to Minister. reduce Your over time. time. Has expired. Senator Waters, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Uh, last week, in a case taken by Youth Verdict, the Land Court of Queensland recommended rejection of Clive Palmer's Waratah Coal Wandoan Mine. The Land Court found that the mine's contribution to climate change and cultural harm outweighed any economic benefit. Will the Environment Minister apply the same reasoning when assessing the 114 coal and gas projects currently before her and reject those damaging projects? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, that, that's actually a question uh, not in the climate portfolio, as you'd know, but in the environment portfolio, but I'm happy to respond to it. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Senator Payne. Uh, I'm aware of that. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, we also don't understanding orders switch portfolios mid-question, but that's fine. I'm happy to take the question. And the, respon the response is, uh, as, I, as I previously said, Senator Waters, uh, obviously those matters that are before Senator uh, Ms Plibersek uh, or whomever holds that portfolio at any time over the past years, those are matters 
uh, that uh, that the minister uh, would exercise in accordance with the statutory discretion. Uh, as you know, uh, our view is that any any project has to stack up environmentally and clearly economically. And I think the reality is, over time, the global markets will uh, reduce the amount of uh, it, the consumption from fossil fuels. I think that Thank is you, demonstrated by a net zero. Advice. Senator Waters, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Given the environmentally, culturally and economically devastating impacts of climate change, particularly for future generations, when will the government commit to introducing a climate trigger into the EPBC Act to require the climate impacts of all large projects to be considered and to allow the outright rejection of big coal, oil and gas projects on climate grounds? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister. I do agree uh, with the characterisation about the urgency of, of action on climate, uh, and I believe our country would have been far better off uh, had we first passed the emissions trading scheme, or second, uh, if we had been able to con continue uh, the uh, uh, clean energy package that uh, Ms Gillard uh, and uh, Ms Gillard's government introduced. Uh, regrettably, that was not the case, and I think we would have been in a more competitive position uh, than we are now in a global economy, which is increasingly prioritising clean energy. Uh, but uh, the, the, the question uh, again goes to a, a policy lever that uh, uh, I understand that, you know, that, that, that those uh, at that end of the chamber have been advocating for. Uh, yeah, some have been advocating for in the community. Uh, we went to the election with a very clear commitment about how we would reduce Australia's emissions and how we would seek to shift Thank our economy Minister, from an emissions five. intent. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government, Senator Watt. Minister, how will the Albanese Labor government continue working with the re-elected Andrews Labor government to deliver important infrastructure projects in my home state of Victoria. Minister Watt. Thank, thank you, President. Thank, thank you, President. Uh, Senator Ducroni. Senator Ducroni, order. Thank you, President. And it seems that even after the election, the trigger words are still there. The Andrews Labor government. Look, trigger, trigger, oh, trigger, trigger. Oh, sorry, I, don't, I didn't mean to say Andrews Labor government. I thank the senator for the question. I know that he's a proud Victorian, and I would hazard a guess that he personally voted for the Andrews Labor government on the weekend. Trigger warning. There's lots of references to the Andrews Labor government in this answer. I should really give you a trigger warning. On Saturday, the Victorian community came together and emphatically endorsed the Andrews Labor government and their agenda for Victoria's future. I would like to congratulate Premier Daniel Andrews on his success and the significant achievement of a third time in government. Despite what you may have heard in this place last week, it's clear that the Victorian community has strongly endorsed the work that Premier Daniel Andrews and his team have done to date, as well as the work to be done over the coming years. And this was despite an increasingly desperate and personal scare campaign run by the Liberals and Nationals both in Victoria uh, and Watt? in the federal government. Minister Watt, resume your seat. Order. 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 I have a senator on her feet. Order. Order. Senator Rustin. Point of order on relevance. I was just wondering whether you might draw the minister's attention to the question. Uh, thank you. I, I will remind uh, Senator Watt. Uh, he has been broadly relevant, but I'll remind him the question was about infrastructure. Thank you, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. It's always good to talk about the Andrews Labor government. And of course, the Albanese Labor government will continue to work with the Andrews Labor government on infrastructure projects throughout the state of Victoria. Through the 2022-23 October budget, we've gone line by line through the previous government's mess of an infrastructure portfolio and cleaned it up while making sure we continue to invest in important projects for Victoria's future. We've put an end to the fake financing and ideological obsession with the East-West Link, and we're, work to, we're working with the Andrews Labor government to invest in the Barwon Heads Road Upgrade Stage 2, the Ison Road Overpass, the El Melbourne Airport Rail Link, the Gippsland Rail Line Upgrade, the Cameron's Land Interchange at Beveridge, and of course, 
the $2.2 billion to the suburban rail loop that will be delivered by an Albanese Labor government and the Andrews Labor Thank you, government. Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Senator Giacconi, first supplementary. Thank you, President, and I thank the minister for that answer. Uh, minister, how will the federal Labor government work with the Victorian Labor government to deliver important infrastructure projects such as the suburban rail loop? Uh, thank you, Senator Giacconi. Minister Watt. President, I'm very pleased you asked about the suburban rail loop, which was, of course, a core commitment of the Andrews Labor government, because the suburban rail loop is a once-in-a-generation infrastructure project that will transform how Victorians move around the state. And while some still don't want to accept the reality of defeat after defeat, the Australian government will work with the newly elected Andrews Senator Labor Henderson. government to Senator honour Henderson. our election commitment to provide $2.2 billion. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. <laughs> Senator Henderson, it is not okay to run a commentary alongside the minister's answer. I would ask you to listen quietly. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. Uh, as I say, we will now honour our election commitment to provide $2.2 billion towards the suburban rail loop east, which has been yet again endorsed by Victorians on the weekend. Uh, but it's not just urban Victorians who will benefit this, from this project. Regional Victorians from Gippsland and the La Trobe Valley will benefit hugely from this project, gaining fast access to Monash University, Monash Health, including the Children's Hospital, all without having to go into central Melbourne, saving an hour of travel. This is an important project, and yet again, Victorians have endorsed it. Thank you, Minister. Senator Giacconi, second supplementary. Thank you again, President. Again, I thank the Minister. Minister, has the Victorian community expressed a view in relation to the delivery of the suburban rail loop by the state and federal government? Minister Watt. Thank you, President. And in fact, Senator Giacconi, it's clear from the results of Saturday night that the people of Victoria have yet again made their view clear on the suburban rail loop, not once but twice this year alone. Communities in Melbourne's east have voted emphatically in favour of this project. Whether it's Bayswater, Glen Waverley or Box Hill on Saturday night or Chisholm and Hotham back in May, local communities have made it clear that they want the delivery of the suburban rail loop. Now, you really would think that the Victorian Liberals would have seen the warning signs after the 2018 election when Victorians backed in the suburban rail loop. Uh, but no, it's like a, a rail line with a big danger ahead sign and Senator Henderson and her friends just charged on. It happened again in the federal election when a government that took the suburban rail loop to the people was backed in. But again, Senator Henderson, Senator Van, Senator McKenzie couldn't hear the warning sides. And now they've driven the coalition train off the track. A massive derailment. Stop digging. We've got tunnelling machines to deal, dig the holes for the rail line. We don't need you digging, Thank but you, you will Minister keep doing Wright, so. Your time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, President. Order. Order. You have a senator on her feet. Senator Chandler. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Over the last three months, the Iranian regime has been accused of killing more than 300 civilians standing up for human rights, particularly Iranian women and girls. The Iranian-Australian community has been calling for weeks for the Australian government to hold the Iranian regime to account. Has the government now applied any targeted sanctions, such as those imposed by like-minded nations? And if not, why not? Thank you, Senator Chandler. Minister. Thank you, um, President. Thank you to Senator Chandler for her question. Uh, and she uh, and I had a uh, discussion about this in estimates, and I would refer her in terms of the action we have been taking to uh, the answer I gave in the Senate last week. Uh, about this issue. Uh, we have taken action uh, against Iran. We have consistently called out the regime publicly for its egregious actions. And I think everybody in this place, every, as, as much as you might like to play a bit of politics with this, Senator Van, everyone in this place would stand united in our condemnation of the brutal repression Senator of Van. civil and political rights in Iran following uh, the tragic death uh, of Masa Amini. So I would, I would make this point. Uh, in relation to sanctions, the senator does know uh, that I, uh, nor any foreign minister before me, including Senator Payne, notwithstanding her interjection, have ever speculated publicly on sanctions. Uh, and 
Uh, so the uh, previously, uh, <coughs> no foreign minister would publicly speculate on sanctions for very good reasons. Uh, I understand uh, the calls from the community uh, in Australia. I met with some representatives last week, and I said to them, "I understand uh, why it is people feel so strongly about this, and why people are so angry." Uh, and uh, I wish it were a world in which Australia uh, and other like-minded countries, such as Canada and the US and New Zealand and many others that we have been working with uh, in the UN context to put pressure on Iran, I wish we could uh, make this better, but we can't. Uh, that is the reality. Uh, this is a repressive regime. We, we have to continue to work with other members of the international community uh, to assert, assert uh, uh, clear pressure in, the, in that context. We have also we have also uh, made representations Thank you, directly Your time has expired. here. Senator Chandler, first Thank you very much, President. Uh, last week, after cancelling a division on my urgency motion calling on this government to take concrete action against the human rights abuses perpetrated by the Iranian government, both the opposition and the Greens clarified their positions as in favour of the motion. What was the government's position on the motion, in support or against, as Labor senators called out at the time? Minister. Thank you. I, I, oh, this is going back a few days now. My, my recollection is that the, the whip indicated the government's position on that motion. Uh, so I'd refer you to Hansard on that. But again, I, I would, well, I, I'm advised that she did. Uh, I'm advised that she did. Uh, and what I would say is I think we, we have been very clear about our position in relation to Iran. And I, and I, find, it, I find it disappointing. I find it disappointing Order. that those opposites are playing politics with an issue when we see people being killed because of their actions and their beliefs. Like I find it extraordinary. Uh, uh, and you think that you think that what uh, what a procedure in the chamber where there was obviously an issue where an explanation had to be given in relation to a vote, you think that somehow is the main issue? No, you know what the issue is. Senator the Rustin. issue is the repression of women and men and children in Iran for standing up for their rights. That's the issue. Uh, Senator Chandler, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Hundreds of Iranian Australians. Kurdish Australians and their supporters have been rallying outside the parliament today. Will the government listen to them and take real action to strengthen Australia's response to the abuses in Iran? Thank you, Senator Chandler. Minister. Uh, I'm aware of that, uh, uh, that protest. I discussed it with members of the community with whom I met last week, uh, and I support uh, their, their right to protest, and I understand their calls. I do understand their calls. Uh, and as I said to uh, members of, uh, as I've said previously to members of the community, I think, uh, you know, I, I, if I were in their position, I perfectly understand why, why they're calling for it. The, the person who holds this office has to make a range of decisions and go through a range of processes uh, uh, and make a judgment in Australia's best interests. I presume the same judgment uh, as the coalition government raised when Iran was elected uh, to uh, the CSW, the Commission on the Status of, the, of Women, and no protest was lodged by the former government. Thank you, Minister. As Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. How are governments working together to meet the continuing health challenges presented by COVID? Thank you, Senator Smith. As Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank, thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator Smith for the question. Governments around Australia are mon monitoring this fourth wave of Omicron very closely. Data released last Friday over the last seven days suggests that the current wave is likely to peak towards the end of November and into early December. The case numbers are up. They're up 10 per cent in the last seven days compared with 47 per cent in the seven days before that and 38 per cent in the seven days before that. So it's important that people continue to take precautions against COVID and the best precaution is to be up to date with vaccinations. The Albanese government is working with states and territories through national cabinet to ensure that we have a strong national response. In the recent budget, we spent, uh, I think, total spending on COVID measures is around $2.6 billion, including funding for the stockpile, vaccines and treatments, and significant investment in aged care. We will continue to work constructively with all states and territory governments because we know that a cooperative, collaborative approach leads to better public health outcomes. 
Governments working closely with their communities is also vital, and we saw evidence of this in the Victorian election on the weekend. No one has done it tougher during this pandemic than the people in Victoria, and the strong, focused leadership of Premier Daniel Andrews through the pandemic has been endorsed with this extraordinary victory. On the weekend, Again. Victorians voted for a competent government. Again. The strong leadership of Premier Andrews and his government show that during the challenges thrown at Victorians during the pandemic, accepting the public health advice, accepting the evidence, making tough decisions but being honest and upfront and transparent does reward you electorally. The government looks forward to working with the Andrews government and all state and territory governments as we tackle this next wave of COVID-19. Thank you, Minister. Senator Smith, first supplementary. Minister, what are we doing to protect older Australians and those in aged care? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Smith. Um, the budget includes funding to support ongoing measures to protect older Australians. Key measures include $810 million in additional funding Order. into the aged care support program grant so that aged care providers continue to be supported with the costs of managing COVID-19. $235 million to ensure aged care, primary care, disability care and First Nations health services will continue to have access to a supply of PPE, treatments, rapid antigen Order. tests. Sorry, I can't hardly Order. hear myself. Order. Senator Wong and Senator Henderson. Senator Thanks. Henderson, you've had a tough weekend, we know. We know you have. You take, take all the time you need. Take all the time you need. The government uh, has been on the front foot to help protect older Australians most at risk of COVID. Our measures to support the aged care sector include pre-deploying summer packs of personal protective equipment to all residential aged care homes, continuing to prioritise boosters and continuing access to surge workforce Thank you, Minister. and additional Your time workers. has expired. Senator Smith, second supplementary. Thank you. Minister, what action is the government taking to ensure more Australians have access to antiviral medication to treat COVID? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Thank Senator Smith for the question. In July this year, the Minister for Health and Aged Care announced the widening of eligibility for antiviral drugs to treat COVID. All Australians aged over 70 who test positive for COVID are now able to access antivirals on the PBS. Access has also been expanded to people over the age of 50 with two or more uh, risk factors for severe disease, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people aged over 30 with two or more risk factors for uh, severe disease. The most recent data shows that 394,100 doses of antivirals have been prescribed and dispensed from the PBS. Prescription numbers increased by 11.8 per cent last week compared to the previous week and approximately 34,130 antiviral prescriptions have been provided to people in residential aged care. Thank you, Minister. Um, Minister Wong. Thank you, President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Can, honor, can senators please leave the chamber with some degree of decorum? Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of questions uh, from Senators McDonald and Rustin to Senator Gallagher. Please proceed. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, we have a, another Labor government and we have <laughs> another Labor tax. Uh, another Labor tax that's been flagged uh, over these past few weeks uh, to now our mining industry, our mining sector. Senator Macdonald asked that. And we heard the normal weasel words we heard way back, way back before 2010, that there are no plans today, no plans today uh, for a tax on the mining industry. But that doesn't mean, of course, there won't be a plan tomorrow. There has been a campaign over the past few weeks uh, to, to leak out, uh, to prepare the ground. Uh, for attacks on, on Australia's mining industry, attacks on Australians' jobs. Uh, and there has been a complete disarray uh, from this government about what they are going to do and how are they going to handle 
the skyrocketing energy prices that Australians are facing this Christmas. Uh, I just got, uh, uh, oh, my wife just uh, told me about our latest electricity bill. It's gone up 15 uh, per cent, and I know a lot of other Australians will be facing that uh, in the months ahead. Now, uh, that's challenging for all Australians, but this government promised Australians, only six months ago at the election, they promised Australians that they would lower their power bills by $275 a year. They didn't just do it once or twice or three times. It wasn't a footnote in their policy. It was said 97 times by the now Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, that they would lower people's power bill bills by $275. Now, they haven't done that. They haven't done that. As we saw in their first budget, power prices are actually due to go up by 56 per cent over the next uh, two years, completely breaking their promise, and now they're in a desperate, a desperate huddle uh, to try and find some other solution to distract people's attention. They don't know what to do in that huddle. They're all doing different things and breaking out in different ways. We have the industry minister, Minister Husich, out there saying that uh, gas companies are greeting and need to be somehow penalised. I think it's unclear exactly what Mr. Husich wants to do to them. We have. Uh, we have uh, Ms King, the Minister King, the Minister for Resources, saying, oh no, it's all fixed. She's fixed it. She signed an MOU uh, with the gas industry and it'll all be fine next year. And we've had uh, the tr Treasury officials come to Senate estimates and, and say that we do need to intervene in gas markets, and they themselves gave credence to this idea of a tax. Now, the reason the problem we've got here is even if, even if uh, the Labor government now gets scared off introducing a tax. This is destroying confidence in our economy. It is destroying investment in our economy. Uh, and that's not what we need right now in a time of high inflation. We need to attract investment to get our economy going. Because if we produce more, if we're more productive, that will help bring inflation down. That will create more goods for all that too much money that's out there. Uh, we saw just, the, just last week the Reserve Bank Governor, uh, Mr Philip Lowe, Give a speech about this, and he highlighted he highlighted that that investment in our resources sector is at a very low level right now. It's uh, running at three percent of GDP uh, investment in resources. Resources itself accounts for seven percent of our GDP, the actual output. So investment in resources is much lower than its share of the economy, which is quite strange right now. Very strange, given that given that uh, the actual uh, price for our resources is at record highs. Uh, so we pre in a previous mining boom that people probably remember, most people probably remember the previous mining boom that peaked in about 2011-2012, uh, when our iron ore, our coal, our gas, our copper, gold, almost all commodities were at record highs. Uh, we had this massive amount of money come through the Treasury here in Canberra. We had record investments in resources at that time. Investment in resources grows to 9 per cent of GDP, $200 billion in our gas industry, massive expansion of iron ore and coal industries across Australia, create thousands of jobs. Thousands of jobs. We had problems. We had problems in regional Queensland because there was too much going on. Uh, you couldn't get a house. Rents were through the roof. But they were probably good problems to have, really, in, in hindsight. Now we don't have that problem. We've got the opposite problem. We're not attracting investment. And that's because this government is not giving people the confidence to invest. Despite these very high prices, uh, we, have, we have coal prices that are sitting at, uh, at $350 a tonne. Now, the previous record was about $180 a tonne, so they're sitting at a level double the previous record right now. Why aren't people investing in the industry? Because there's no confidence here. They don't know what the government policy is. The government doesn't know what their policy is. They're arguing with each other. They're talking about taxes and regulations and all these types of penalties that might be imposed on someone. You're not going to invest. You're not going to create jobs if you have no confidence in what the policy settings will be in the years ahead when you have to pay that investment back. So I implore the government to get their act together before Christmas. Before Christmas, give a, give a present to the thousands of Australians that rely on the resources industry for their jobs, for their livelihoods, and let us know what you're actually doing so we can take advantage of this, this record opportunity to invest Thank in you, our Senator country. Thank you, Senator Kenavan. Senator White. I rise to talk about uh, the question of and respond to the question from Senator Rustin. Let's talk about GPs. Let's talk about what our health system what is like um, after we've inherited nine, nine long years of cuts and neglect of Medicare. It's never been harder or more expensive to see a doctor than it is now. The former government froze the Medicare re rebate for six years, ripping billions of dollars out of primary care and causing gap fees to skyrocket. 
I myself saw last week a delegation of GPs about this, and they talked about the hardship of running uh, practices in a range of areas, not just in rural and regional areas, but in uh, but in metropolitan areas and out of metropolitan areas. That is a direct result of the freezing of the Medicare re rebate that has been frozen for six years. Those are the real problems that are facing our GPs. And it's no wonder young doctors are walking away from general practice in droves. Just as every new Labor government has always has to do, we're, we're cleaning up the mess that's been left behind by the Liberal Party, not just uh, in, uh, in all the other areas that we've discussed, but also in this um, massive area of health and uh, what our GPs need, want and what our public deserves. In 2019, the Morrison government arbitrarily axed the ability of a long list of communities to recruit overseas trained doctors to fill gaps in general practice in those outer, suburban, uh, outer suburbs and the regions. That was a travesty, uh, and that has caused part of the shortages. That has caused part of the shortages that we are seeing today. Labor initiated a Senate inquiry uh, into the GP shortages in the last parliament as the minister uh, discussed. And it, it has heard mountains of evidence of people not being able to see a GP at all, about having to wait months for an appointment and having travel, to travel hours when they do finally get one. I myself have seen many, many workers who have not been able to get medical certificates um, from doctors because they just could not get an appointment, not in rural and regional areas, but in suburban Melbourne. They could not see it, then they got docked for their pay because they could not could not uh, get a medical certificate uh, when they were genuinely sick. Uh, we have deliberately not changed the regional incentive payments that doctors receive for working in remote Australia, exactly because we recognise the importance of providing additional incentives for doctors to work in those remote and regional communities. The government funds a range of programs and incentives to encourage GPs to re relocate and work there, in addition to uh, the DPA. The Albanese government is committed to investing in general practice and strengthening Medicare with almost $1 billion of investment. Our Strengthening Medicare Task Force will identify the best ways to boost affordability, improve access and deliver better support for patients with ongoing and chronic illnesses, backed by the $750 million Strengthening Medicare Fund. That's real progress. Those are real policies, which is in total contrast to what the, the uh, Liberal National Government had done for the long nine years beforehand. That is why we're in crisis, because of the lack of policies, in fact, some policies that were anti-GPs, uh, and that's what we are trying to repair. You know, certainly, after working tirelessly through the pandemic, we'll give our doctors the resources to invest in their GP practices with our $220 million strengthening Medicare GP grants. That is real policy. That is real progress. And that will make a massive difference to GPs um, in rural, regional and also suburban areas. We're also investing $146 million to attract and retain more health workers to rural and regional Australia. This will mean more trials of new innovative models of primary care. During the pandemic, we saw um, a range of innovations which we think can be continued beyond the, the pandemic time. There's also going to be more than a thousand places under the John Flynn Prevocational Doctor Program to encourage more hospital-based junior doctors to enter general practice in rural Australia. That's how we're going to get doctors into rural Australia, by placing incentives on the table and encouraging young doctors to go to, to those locations. There'll also be additional training for rural generous registrations. Registrars, GP registrars and follow, fellowed GPs to undertake advanced skills training. That is real policy. That is what the Albanese government is doing uh, and that will make a massive difference, not just to rural and regional areas but to suburban Australia as well. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to take note of the question from Senator Rustin of uh, Minister Gallagher. I hardly know where to start with this appalling Labor policy. Uh, as other colleagues have said, it is absolutely detrimental uh, to the health care of Australians, some of Australia's most vulnerable in rural, regional and also remote areas. Now, it was even worse when you 
consider that the government admitted during estimates that they had done not a second of consultation with people who might be concerned. So they've called a task force instead of actually going out and talking to the people of Western Australia, going out into regional and remote communities to talk to these communities who are so starved of GP care. Now, by the DP area classification, the DPA classification, uh, now to include outer metro areas, is such a retrograde step for so many people in Western Australia. Because let me tell you what Labor has done to Western Australia in terms of health. We've got a health system in absolute crisis and chaos. We've got record ramping. We've got uh, record code blacks. We've got our nurses in uproar and on strike. And now, not only are we 350 doctors short in our hospitals in Western Australia, young doctors short in our hospitals, we are over 100, 100 GPs short, mostly in rural and remote communities. So what does that mean? That means that West Australians, who are our most vulnerable, who need health care the most in uh, Indigenous communities and in other uh, remote areas, cannot get the health care they need. And this will make it worse. The minister, Minister Butler, couldn't even say today how many communities were impacted. Well, let me tell you, if we're 100 GPs short in Western Australia, the vast majority of them are in regional and remote areas. And according to West Australian doctors, that means in every town without a GP or with un under service by GPs, that means there are 50 people a day who are not getting the support and the medical support they need. 50 people a day per doctor for our most uh, vulnerable. So shame on Labor. Again, policy on the run and without even consulting anyone. So let me finish by providing some of the information that if Labor had actually come to Western Australia, gone out into regional Australia, they would find out. So as I've said, regional health is struggling by 100 doctors we're missing and we cannot get, and about 50 patients a day. So even in areas that are closer to the city, take, for example, 2J, um, that they're now absolutely concerned because they're competing with Margaret River. We're competing with the coast, and they're now competing with uh, outer suburbs of Perth. Shame on Labor. For the remaining time, I give the call to Senator Roberts. Thank you, uh, Mr. Acting De Mr. Deputy President. I speak in response to, and I take note of, Senator Wong's inaccurate and misleading statements in response to Senator Hansen's questions. The Ukraine conflict does not affect coal-fired electricity prices in this country because our domestic coal-fired power stations have long-term price contracts. They are not subjected to the spot international prices. Fuel prices in coal secondly, fuel prices in coal-fired generation are a tiny proportion of the costs. Secondly, no country transitioning to unreliable solar and wind has reduced electricity prices. Countries that increase solar and wind increase electricity prices every time. The relationship is approximately linear. More solar, more wind, higher prices. Thirdly, CSIRO projections rely on applying unfavourable or sorry, favourable and unreasonable hurdle rates for investing in unreliable and expensive solar and wind costs. CSIRO cost assessments of solar and wind do not include construction costs, the roads, the bridges, etc. coming in, disposal costs every 10 to 15 years, which is three times for the equivalent life of a coal-fired power station, new offshore turbines so big that they have to build ships dedicated to moving them, cost of the ships not included, batteries essential for continuity of supply in wind and solar, not needed for coal, an extra $100 billion on, on solar and, and wind that are not included in the costings. Grid stability management due to wind and solar being unstable and asynchronous are not included in the costings. Transmission lines, because the distance from the generation sources to the cities where the customers are, are so big, the transmission lines are estimated to be an extra $50 billion expense not needed for coal-fired power. Why are solar and wind still subsidised? Who pays for these subsidies? The electricity users. That's what's driving up in part our, coal, our, our uh, electricity generation costs. Senator Payman. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I would like to—I rise to take note of uh, Senator Macdonald's um, question to Senator Gallagher. Um, I'm so astonished to stand here and hear about those opposite, uh, after a decade of delay, denial and destruction, to have the audacity to stand there and tell us what to do. 
We've clearly went to the election and we saw what the Australian people wanted. They wanted change. They wanted a progressive government who will take action, who won't break their promises, who will ensure that Australians' voices are heard. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite astonishing to see even my um, colleagues from uh, Western Australia stand up and talk about what's best for Australians. Well, you had a decade. What did you do? Um, and, and despite the delaying tactics from the opposition, it's really refreshing to see that the government is going to be delivering on its commitments um, because, of course, the adults are back in charge and we will take the reins and run with it. Now, we've made it clear that we're prepared to consider a range of options when it comes to high energy prices in an energy market which is putting a lot of pressure on Australians and we see it day in, day out. Um, and obviously that pressure is replicated on an Australian industry. Um, we've said that our priority is on regulation, on the side of regulation rather than on taxation side, but we're going through this in a thoughtful and considered way because that's what Labor governments do. We take precautionary measures, we have an incredible amount of consultation before we make decisions, um, and we ensure that it's in the best interests of all Australians. A windfall tax is not our preference, and we've said it before, our preference is a regulatory solution. Of course, we're dealing with these rising power prices in large part because Russia's illegal war in Ukraine, but also in small part as the consequence of the wasted decade by those opposite, including more than 20 failed energy policies. Yeah, get it, 20 failed energy policies. The former government's fingerprints are all over those power prices prices rises, um, especially the member for Hume, who hid the price rises that he knew about before the election. Surprise, surprise. Australians know we didn't cause this mess, but we do take responsibility for cleaning it up, because again, adults are back in charge. A windfall tax wouldn't help with the near-term economic challenges, including the growing inflation challenge we have right now. Our priority when it comes to tax reform is ensuring multinationals pay their share, their fair share of tax here in Australia. That will play a part in repairing the budget, a budget that has been destroyed. Uh, and we've seen um, with all our work to get rid of the rorts and waste that have contributed to a trillion dollars of debt left to us that didn't come with the economic dividend. Multinational corporations making a profit in Australia should pay their fair share of tax in Australia, and our multinational tax package will close tax loopholes exploited by multinationals and improve tax transparency, because that's what Australian people want to see, integrity and transparency restored back in our political system. This will benefit Australians by funding vital services like Medicare, aged care and childcare, helping to service the trillion dollars of debt racked up by the, those opposite and levelling the playing field for Australian businesses. Now, the government has committed to tackling multinational tax avoidance in four ways. Uh, supporting the OECD's two-pillar solution for a global 15 per cent minimum tax and ensuring some of the profits of the largest multinationals, particularly digital firms, are taxed where the products or services are sold, limiting debt-related deductions by multinationals at 30 per cent of the profits, um, limiting the ability for multinationals to abuse Australia's tax uh, treaties when holding intellectual property in tax havens, and finally introducing transparency measures, including reporting requirements um, on tax information, beneficial ownership, tax haven exposure, and relation to government tenders. And as I like to uh, reiterate before going, um, that it is time to have integrity and transparency back in our political system, and that's what Labor is delivering. Senator Little. Thank you. Well, the question was, what's the plan for more GPs in areas of greatest need? Changes like the recent expansion of the distribution priority area classifications by the Albanese Labor government have only had a negative impact as we work to address workforce challenges in rural and regional Australia. 
Solving for a problem in one area by making the situation worse for another is a really ill-conceived solution to a really serious issue. The DPA classification system was designed as a crucial part of solving the GPs crisis in rural communities by identifying areas of greatest need. The decision to expand the priority status classification to outer metropolitan suburbs has effectively rendered any advantage for rural and remote parts of the country to the dustbin. The Rural Doctors Association of Australia has stated that this policy change will cost the lives of rural and remote patients who are already suffering poorer health outcomes. We have already seen a number of real-life examples of how this expansion has pulled international medical graduates away from rural communities who are crying out for GPs. Examples include a doctor who was headed for Hewenville in Tasmania, but because they now have the option of living in Hobart under the DPA changes, the Hewenville community were left without the primary care support that doctor would have provided. The regional centre of Mildura has also been battling to keep many of its IMGs following the closure of a major clinic because practising in Dandenong is now an option. When asked in estimates if the Albanese government had consulted with rural and regional communities before deciding to expand the DPA classifications and make it harder for them to attract doctors, Assistant Minister McCarthy replied, no. Labor have consistently refused to even acknowledge the impact of this decision on rural communities. And today, in question time, Minister Butler couldn't even provide the number of towns who have lost a GP since the decision came into effect. Right now, we need to be absolutely focused on ensuring the right levers are in place to get more doctors practicing in the bush, not making it harder for rural communities to attract GPs. We will continue to seek answers from the government on this serious issue until they provide some transparency on the full extent of the impact that their decision is having on rural, regional and remote communities. It has been clear that the Albanese Labor government does not have a plan to address the critical workforce shortages we are seeing across Australia's health care sector, particularly in relation to GPs. So far, all we've seen from this government is their dedication to copying coalition policies from the election. They have not announced one single new initiative that meaningfully responds to GP shortages as they are unfolding. The government's Jobs and Skills Summit was meant to address this issue, but all it delivered was another talk fest that failed to deliver any real plans. The only initiative they have actually delivered, expanding the distribution priority area DPA classifications for overseas trained doctors, has exacerbated the problem by ripping away GPs from many rural and regional communities who are already struggling with GP shortages. Labor are too busy working on their next grab line for a headline, instead of with the practices and communities on the ground who understand the issue and are crying out for the government to listen. Don't take my word. RACGP Rural Chair Dr Michael Clements has said, this will absolutely lead to an immediate migration of doctors out of rural and remote areas and more closer to bigger cities as a direct consequence. Minister Butler must urgently explain to the Australian public and the health care sector if he has a plan to address the issue of GP shortages that are unfolding across the country. We asked, who did you consult? How many towns were negatively affected? That is what we need the answer to, and we don't need any more services or GPs exiting rural, regional and remote communities. I put the question to the motion as moved by Senator Canavan. Those for the question say aye, against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, you. Mr. Deputy President, I rise to take note of the questions I asked Senator Watt representing the Communications Minister earlier today. And that, of course, was in relation to the disastrous uh, performance of some in the Murdoch press. Uh, over the last uh, number of months, increasingly uh, becoming um, fever pitch with hysteria and, of course, craziness. 
And this, of course, has uh, come to a head over the weekend. We've had the results of the Victorian election, where overwhelmingly Victorians rejected uh, the overt political campaign trumpeted by uh, quarters of the Murdoch press, and in fact, voters seemingly ignored ignored uh, what happened and what was being printed on the front pages of the News Corp papers or seen uh, in the crazy uh, shows late at night on Sky News. Front page after front page after front page uh, of the News Corp newspapers uh, argued that voters should vote the other way, and it seems overwhelmingly that Victorians ignored it. This, of course, Mr Deputy President, the reason I have asked the questions around the need for media diversity is because if a democracy is to be strong, if a democracy is to be robust, if a diversity of voices are to be represented in our parliaments and we have good government policy in the interests of all Australians, we need a strong, reliable, trustworthy news media sector. And what we've got in this country is a media sector that is overwhelmingly concentrated, more than many other comparable countries in the world, by one particular corporation. And that, of course, uh, is the Murdoch Empire and News Corp. And that part of the Australian media has become a parody of itself. Hysteria, lies, mistruths, and more and more and more opinion over journalism, opinion over fact. Meanwhile, there are good journalists working across all uh, parts of the Australian media who are just trying to do their job and do it well, who have good stories to tell, have good investigative stories to tell, and want to be able to do their part of upholding a strong democracy. Journalists should be able to question governments, hold governments to account, and know that when they have a good story, when they are onto something, that they can have that published and believed. But what we've got in this country is the Murdoch press dragging down every journalist in this country, even their own. There are some very, very good journalists who work within the Murdoch empire. Don't get me wrong. And I feel increasingly sorry for them, that they work within an organisation that has become a parody of itself, seemingly disinterested in truth, disinterested in fact, disinterested in upholding democracy. And this is why we need to have a serious account of media diversity in this country. We do need a judicial inquiry with the powers of a royal commission to ensure we have a media we ensure we have media regulation that is fit for purpose and fit for the modern world whether it's the dominance of the craziness that comes out of our social media platforms the big media giants without any control without any regulation they think they can do whatever they want and just look at what Elon Musk is doing with Twitter right now. He's fired not just half his staff, but the very people that protect everyday users and citizens from harmful and dangerous content. Twitter is becoming a cesspool, and that is it. A cesspool of hate, trolls and misinformation. And on the other hand, you've got the other domination of the media in the Murdoch press, which cares little about fact and real information. We need to fix the media landscape in this country. We need laws and regulations that are fit for purpose. And it shouldn't be up to the politicians to pick and choose. This needs to be at arm's length. Thank and you, that Sarah. is why we yeah. need a royal commission and I'll we need put, one today. I'll put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it.